A show's villain is as important as its hero, but that doesn't mean we always know who the bad guy is right away. Here's a spoiler-filled list of the best bad guy reveals in TV history. When Lost arrived in 2004, there wasn't much like it on the small screen. It featured an enormous cast and brought over 18 million viewers to ABC, the highest ratings for an offering on the network in almost four years. One thing the show didn't have, however, was an honest-to-goodness villain. The survivors of downed Oceanic Flight 815 had to weather some pretty singular adversities. There was the smoke monster, of course, and the everlasting conflict between anti-hero Sawyer and, well, everyone else. But Lost was missing a true big bad. All that changed, however, when actor Michael Emerson showed up as the mysterious Henry Gale in Season 2. Some of the members of the group felt Henry's stories about arriving on the island in a hot air balloon and losing his wife in the subsequent crash were a bit too neat to be true. So in the Season 2 episode Lockdown, the Oceanic survivors go looking for answers. They find a balloon and a grave, but Henry's wife isn't in it. The real Henry is. When the phony Gale is called out for the falsehood, Emerson really shines in the role. He seems to morph into an entirely different person, Ben Linus, in the blink of an eye. This manipulative antagonist would go on to wreak havoc on the island in the following seasons, finally giving Lost a true villain. The inaugural season of True Detective follows two investigators, played by Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson, on the hunt for a serial killer. Throughout the season, the show's writer and director expertly build the expectation of the evil we'll encounter when we meet our villain. The protagonists' escalating run-ins with voodoo, kidnapping cover-ups, and violent meth dealers signal that whatever is waiting at the end won't be pretty. At the end of Season 1, Episode 7, audiences are finally clued into the killer's identity, and it's an almost forgettable groundskeeper from way back in Episode 3. In the hands of a lesser creative team, the moment might have felt like a lazy callback. Not so here. By the time deranged killer Errol Childress appears, casually giving two other police officers directions from his lawnmower, viewers have witnessed a laundry list of evil deeds. The dread of confronting something much worse than what the two leads have previously encountered is as thick as Louisiana's humidity. As Errol watches the police officers drive off and the creepy music starts to play, we see scars on the lower part of his face consistent with descriptions of a suspect. Revelatory moments like this one really marked the slow-burning first season of True Detective for greatness. The closing moments of After You're Gone dared the audience to keep watching and almost make viewers hope Harrelson and McConaughey stay at home. Stop. Really, man. Stop. I don't want to hear it. For much of The Flash Season 1, Harrison Wells acts as the kindly genius founder of Star Labs. He supports Barry Allen's efforts as a superhero and serves as his mentor. Over the course of the season, however, his character begins to act increasingly strange, and Flash and his respective allies suspect something is off. A stinger in Episode 9 shows the audience that Harrison is in possession of Reverse Flash's iconic suit, but the show doesn't confirm the worst until Episode 15. By that point, most of Team Flash suspect Wells is the Yellow Speedster, but not everyone is convinced. Unfortunately, Wells' surrogate son, Sisko, finds out the hard way. After Sisko discovers where Wells hides the suit in the previous episode, Wells confronts him, admitting that he not only had a hand in Barry's mother's death, but is actually Eobard Thawne, Flash's all-time big bad. Anyone wondering why Wells might announce his secrets so bluntly gets their answer when Wells follows his monologue by killing Sisko. This moment, where Thawne admits his sins and kills a character his alter ego cared about, cements the villain's full arrival and the scope of his malevolence. And it happened in the first episode back from the show's mid-season break, giving fans a compelling reason to keep tuning in. Marvel's WandaVision kicks off when the Scarlet Witch finds herself married to a newly risen Vision in an idyllic sitcom-style existence. Viewers watch as Wanda tries to embrace her new life, but slowly discovers something's amiss. All isn't what it appears to be in Wanda's primetime network town, especially when it comes to her neighbors. Throughout the series, Wanda has kooky and friendly encounters with a neighbor named Agnes, played by a scenery-chewing Katherine Hahn. Like any sitcom neighbor, she's a bit snoopy, but mostly kind, until the end of Episode 7. While Wanda takes a day to recharge, Agnes looks after her children. Soon, though, Wanda suspects she and her family are in danger and goes to collect her kids. 
Where are the twins? Agnes tells Wanda the kids are playing in the basement. When Wanda descends the stairs, she finds a witch's lair. Agnes then walks into the room and introduces herself as a fellow witch named Agatha Harkness. As Agnes invades Wanda's mind, the show suddenly cuts to the song Agatha All Along. In one catchy tune, Agatha is revealed to have been pulling Wanda's strings throughout the whole series, and worse, she's killed Wanda's dog. The number is a great showcase for Han's charisma and enormously raises the stakes for the coming series climax by introducing the main antagonist. Who needs subtle reveals? More theme songs, please. When Westworld first premiered in 2016, its robo-cowboy world-building and unique storytelling made it must-see TV. As the show confidently swaggered through its time-bending opening season, it delivered twist after twist. One of the most devastating was the finale's bad guy reveal. In the show's premiere, audiences are introduced to Jimmy Simpson's William and Ed Harris's Man in Black. On first impressions, the two stand in stark contrast to one another. William is a meek but kind first-timer in the theme park, and the Man in Black is a park veteran who revels in doing horrible things to its animatronic hosts. As the series unfolds, it becomes clear that the show's story is set in two distinct timelines. However, since Westworld was co-created by Jonathan Nolan, brother and collaborator to the notoriously confusing director Christopher Nolan, it's not always clear exactly which timeline is which. The show sets the record straight when its protagonist, robotic host Dolores, played by Evan Rachel Wood, encounters the Man in Black in the series finale. He reveals that they've met before, and that his first encounter with Dolores helped him find himself. Dolores remembers who he is, calling him William, and the editors intercut his monologue with sequences that show the once gentle William becoming the evil man he is now. It's tragic that someone so kind could wind up so vile, but in a pivotal moment to the show, his gutting reveal clearly establishes what's present and what's past. Not many detective shows leave audiences as shaken as Broadchurch did, and all of that is due to its villain reveal. In the show, detectives Ellie Miller and Alec Hardy are investigating the murder of an 11-year-old named Danny. Like most detective shows, in the end, the partners get their man, but by the time it's over, audiences and protagonists alike will wish the villain had never been revealed. The show builds up our trust in relationships by dedicating notable attention to the supportive relationship between Ellie and her husband, Joe. So in the end, when Hardy discovers Ellie's husband, Joe, is in possession of Danny's phone, anybody watching prays it's a red herring. But it's not. A flashback reveals that Joe murdered Danny because Danny threatened to expose their pedophilic affair to the town. It's awful on so many levels and adds real bite to the series' focus on trust and secrets. The murder scene's frantic editing showcases just how fast the threat of exposure escalates things between Joe and his young victim. Once they find out what happened, viewers sit with turning stomachs waiting for Ellie to discover her husband's secret. Only such a powerfully depressing reveal can make the audience hope one of the protagonists never learns the truth. The HBO series Watchmen has a bad guy reveal that is quite different from its graphic novel bad guy reveal. When viewers first meet Lady True, she's a brilliant, conglomerate-owning, clone-maintaining scientist with a hidden agenda. However, it's not clear just how dark that agenda is until it's too late. At first, the show's big bad appears to be an organization called Cyclops, a white supremacist group out to steal Dr. Manhattan's powers. However, when they attempt their plot in the finale, their leader gets turned into a puddle, and his followers are teleported away to find True waiting with an even larger evil plan. True reveals herself as the real Puppet Master and the daughter of Adrian Veidt, the surprise villain in the comics. It's brilliant because it not only connects True to a character from the source material, but also connects their murderous motives. In the comics, Adrian blew up Manhattan to trick the world into agreeing to world peace. In the HBO series, True murders Dr. Manhattan in an attempt to subjugate the world to her benevolent will. The comic and TV series are separated by decades of cultural change, but the latter's villain reveal unites their central questions about wielding immense power over other people in the service of a personal utopian vision. Humanizing a murderer is tricky in any medium, but Showtime's Dexter managed to do it for eight seasons and was eventually revived for a ninth. The show's premise that Dexter is a serial killer who only kills other serial killers is a strong way to hook an audience. As the show goes on, however, its elaborate twists and turns prove it's more than just an engaging hook. 
During season one, the show fleshes out Dexter's healthy relationship with his adopted sister, Deb. It also establishes a rivalry between himself and a serial killer known only as the Ice Truck Killer. So things get complicated when the audience discovers that the man courting Deb is actually, gasp, the Ice Truck Killer himself. In a reveal so casual it demands an immediate rewatch, Deb discusses plans for a date with her suitor, Rudy. Rudy tells Deb he needs to wrap up some housework before coming over. After he hangs up the phone, the audience gets a look at what the work is, chopping and packing human body parts in his walk-in murder freezer. It's an impeccable dramatic irony. The viewers know the truth about Rudy, but Deb and Dexter remain in the dark for a long time. For the remainder of the season, the audience watches Dexter and Deb inch closer to the truth and the danger, and the tension is tangible. Dexter is engrossing entertainment, and moments like these cement its place in great TV history. The villain reveal at the end of HBO's Sharp Objects is probably the most audacious on this list, casting the events of the entire show in a new light. Sharp Objects is based on Gillian Flynn's novel of the same name. Yep, the same author behind Gone Girl, another story with a shocking villain reveal. HBO's miniseries follows crime reporter Camille Preaker as she returns home to Wind Gap, Missouri. There, she gets caught up investigating the murders of some local girls. In between sleuthing, she navigates her complex relationships with her mother, Adora, and teen half-sister, Ama. Ultimately, Camille discovers evidence suggesting Adora killed the girls and sends her own mother to prison. Bleak stuff. But this is a Gillian Flynn story we're talking about. It can always get a lot worse in the most unexpected ways, and moments before the credits roll, it does. Literally, within the show's closing minutes, Camille discovers evidence hidden in Ama's room that suggests she was the killer all along. Ama appears in the doorway, sees Camille, and whispers, don't tell Mama. The show hard cuts to the credits, but anyone trying to catch their breath is acting too soon. A mid-credits scene shows Ama definitively committing each murder, including that of a new friend, May, sometime later after she and Camille moved to St. Louis. It's brilliant and possibly one of the most depressing endings ever committed to the small screen. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite TV shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.